Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, former Federal Revenue Minister Garth Turner discusses the future value of real estate. Energy expert Marin Katusa discusses Middle East unrest and how that could affect the price of oil. And Jack Crooks of Black Swan Capital looks at Japan's economic experiment. We'll get to Garth Turner right after this. The best of the best. Randy Elvis Frisky and his Las Vegas show band with Cassandra Frisky. Remembering Elvis Presley on the anniversary of his passing. Bell Center in Surrey, August 16th. Cultural Center in Chilliwack, 17. Details at RandyElvisFrisky.com. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Sitting in for Phil Mackesy, here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Garth Turner of turnertomlinson.ca and financial advisor to Raymond James. Uh, you might remember his name as well back when he was National Revenue Minister back in the early 90s. Garth, when you were in charge of revenue, did we have a surplus or a deficit then? <laughs> Well, I think at that time, if I cast my mind back, yeah, the country was in, uh, was in a deficit and, you know, went actually more into a deficit for quite a period of time. Uh, of course, uh, until we got through to the, um, situation where, uh, we had a lot of cutbacks in government and, uh, that would have happened, I guess, in the Cretchen years. But, you know, national finances have never been in great shape now for quite some period of time. And sadly, I don't think we're getting too much better right now, Jim. I thought we were supposed to be getting better with a positive federal budget expected in a year or two. No, I would be extremely surprised if Mr. Flaherty is able to pull off a balanced budget by 2015, which was his original uh, goal. And I think he pushed it back to 2016, and I think it's going to be further in the future than that. Uh, we have a substantial budgetary deficit. Uh, actually, during the recessionary years, 2009, 2010, we hit the all-time high for a, a deficit, a shortfall in Canada. So it's not going to be wiped out that easily. And right now, Jim, the economy actually is losing altitude. We have growth that is uh, probably, when the numbers come out for the last quarter, it's probably going to be uh, negative. And that's not a, that's not a good sign. Is it the start of another recession, or is it just a temporary downturn? Uh, no, I think it's a downturn. I don't believe that we're going into uh, another recession at this time. Can we believe the numbers that the uh, government gives us? Uh, I know they made an adjustment in the way they make inflation numbers now or, or calculate them. They decided that they would take out real estate and energy. And, and what things cost you more as a Canadian than putting a, a roof over your head and making sure you can get to and from work with your car? Yeah, I know exactly. Well, it's always been a, a really weird way to measure the cost of living. Actually, they don't even factor in the price of housing. It's the carrying cost of housing. So when you get a situation where the price of a home in Vancouver has gone up by 70% in the past 10 years, that actually, believe it or not, does not even make its way in to the cost of living index. So it's a, it's a very poor gauge of uh, the actual burden on, on Canadian families right now. Uh, so I, you know, just uh, regrettably, uh, it needs to be reformed, but it has not. Why won't they reform it? Is it because the numbers would just look so horrible? <laughs> I think it'd be too scary. Oh my God. And you know, you've got all these government programs that are tied to the inflation rate. Uh, think of OAS, you know, old age security or CPP. Think of all those wrinkly boomers like me who are going to be collecting money for 20 years. And all of that, of course, is tied into the rate of inflation. Every time inflation goes up, those social payments have to go up. I think the government's got a vested interest in uh, keeping us, uh, shall we say, a little bit dumb. They tell us that inflation's around 2% or so, give or take you know, a little bit on either side. Uh, what's the real number? Uh, it's hard to say. I would think that if you do factor in the overall living costs, it's at least going to be double that uh, and probably a bit more. That still historically is not that off the mark if we have inflation of around 5%. But what bothers me, Jim is we've got wages and salaries going up in Canada right now at around 1%. So that means 
that even with the official inflation rate, people are falling further and further behind. And with the sort of actual inflation rate, it, it actually becomes more difficult. That is why we're seeing debt increase. And there's nothing more significant in Canada today than the accumulation of debt. It is coming to define us. Uh, I noticed the latest survey I saw from Bank of Montreal uh, just the other day showed that household debt has basically gone up 12% in a year from their calculation. And although debt is going up, people's monthly payments are not. So people are choosing to pay a little less each month, and their aggregate debt uh, increases. And of course, there's no greater culprit for that than, than real estate. How are we going to cope? How are we going to be able to, to buy land? Or will that just be something only the rich will be able to do? It's becoming more of that. We've had a lot of people who have become real estate owners. Of course, we've got 70% real estate ownership level in Canada. It's one of the highest in the world. But our household debt is extraordinary as well. So clearly we have not been able to buy that real estate based on increases in income. We have done it by increasing debt. And of course our debt levels today are so high, but interest rates are so low. Uh, not a good combination. We know that interest rates will normalize. Central banks will be raising them as, ec as economies uh, pick up a bit of steam. It's going to take a while yet. But interest rates won't be lower, they'll be higher, and uh, it's only going to increase the burden. This is why I think we're facing quite a number of years of really slow growth in Canada, and uh, it is going to come around and, I think, bite a lot of people who have made these poor decisions in their own lives. Maybe people weren't aware of what the real numbers were when they got into the, you know, buying their house here in Vancouver, average price uh, around a million, a million bucks. Mm -hmm. They may not have been aware, but I think it's more financial illiteracy than willful ignorance. I just don't think people understand. They don't figure it out. Everyone takes a look at the monthly payment. Oh, man, can I afford that? Can I carry it per month? Instead of taking a look at the overall debt load. It's almost generational. A lot of younger people today just take a look at, you know, they equate the monthly cost of carrying something to sort of, well, what would it cost to rent it? Is it kind of the same or not? Don't really understand that they're taking on hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt that is often very difficult to get out of. One of my concerns about residential real estate is illiquidity. That means you can't turn it into cash easily. You can't sell it easily. And when markets go down, we have fewer buyers, and ultimately it becomes more and more difficult to sell. Uh, and that's happening certainly around the lower mainland. Certain segments of the market are turning illiquid. Uh, I take a look, for example, at a market like Victoria, which is relatively small population base, relatively expensive homes. And my goodness, there are so many people sitting on million-dollar properties who have been doing so for two two years now, two and a half years, and haven't been able to sell them. That's illiquidity. And I keep telling people who are, you know, boomers, who boomers have been infatuated with real estate, they've got the bulk of their net worth there. And these often are the people who don't have enough income, but they have all this house. And man, they're in tough shape if they can't sell. Could they rely on something like a reverse mortgage? Ah, uh, you could. But it's not the greatest option. A reverse mortgage is a reverse mortgage. And with a regular mortgage, of course, you, you make payments, but you're going to end up paying three times back what you borrow because of amortization. Well, with a reverse mortgage, you don't actually make any payments, so the amortized interest just keeps building and building up. So you can end up uh, you know, selling your home and owing far, far more than you ever borrowed. Or you can die and your estate actually is going to get wiped out by those accumulated payments, which is why I've always tell, told people a reverse mortgage is wonderful if you hate your kids. I was going to ask too, uh, the mortgage rate that you pay for a reverse mortgage, I don't think a lot of people understand. It's actually a loan and it has uh, quite a substantial interest rate. It does, yes. It's far higher than going off and borrowing a regular mortgage now at, you know, prime or prime minus a half. Uh, often this is prime minus one or two or three percent. So it's pretty damn expensive money as well. You're quite right. Is there any solution for the average person who's holding on to their million dollar house 
and not being able to move it? Oh, they're going to have to sell it for less. It's an open market. I just don't think prices are going to bounce back. I think, in fact, we're on a long-term downward slope, especially in the lower mainland. Uh, I think prices will be uh, less in uh, a year, two, three, and four than they are today. Not dramatically. I don't think there's going to be a crash like in the United States where you go down 70% in three years like Atlanta or Phoenix or Miami. I don't think that's going to happen. But I do think we're going to lose, you know, one, two, three percent per year uh, over the course of five or six years. And we do end up with a 20 or 25 percent lower value than today. That's pretty substantial. If you've got a million dollar home with closing costs, you've just lost 300,000 bucks. So uh, my advice to people is if you've been thinking about selling, don't think about it. Do it. Don't. <laughs> you'll be surprised at what you don't get later on. Exactly. Is real estate still a good long-term investment if you plan to live in your home and uh, you're looking at, say, 10 years? I know some people, when they buy, they, they look at it. If I rent for 10 years and I leave, I don't get anything when I leave this home. At least if I buy it, I get something. Maybe. Uh, it's not guaranteed. If the scenario I just painted actually comes to pass, you can own a home for 10 years and you have will will have built up no equity in the home. Uh, and you paid the equivalent of rent or more for all of that period of time. So the scenario you, you just painted is one that's based on inflation. If we don't have inflation, if we have a slow economy, if real estate has already peaked generationally in value, then you're actually wiser to rent it than own it because you could be paying a mortgage payment, paying amortized interest for 10 years, actually building up a very small amount of equity, which could be wiped out by any decline in the in the capital value of that home. Uh, that's a concept Canadians aren't really used to. Uh, I think they do need to get used to it. Americans learned that lesson uh, quickly and um, seriously, and we just weren't paying attention. I, I do think it is a danger now, and I wish more pe- more people would contemplate it. Do you think, in, at least in the lower mainland, they're relying on the fact that a, between forty and 50,000 people move into the, the region, if you include the Fraser Valley? Well, maybe, but there's immigration everywhere. I mean, certainly there's far more people moving into Seattle and San Francisco and Los Angeles and uh, all up and down the uh, uh, the American seaboard. So Canada's not unique at all, and it, certainly that immigration did not save American real estate values. I don't know why we're all that different. I mean, we think we're different. We think we're a bunch of snowflakes, but actually we're not. Uh, so I think it's one of those things that's thrown out the same as, you know, they're not making land anymore or Vancouver's stuck between the, you know, mountains and the sea. So, you know, we're always going to have higher prices. That's malarkey. Uh, we're at a point now where when we hit a million dollars for the basic single family home, in Vancouver, uh, sales started to go down. And, of course, why wouldn't they? Who's going to afford that? Uh, so it, it's really supply and demand. That's what dictates commodity values. Uh, and I think uh, we're just starting to understand that. And I think, too, a warning sign for commodity values. Uh, the Chinese central government the other day ordering regional and local governments not to approve any new real estate projects for the next five years. Yeah, what goes on in China is often a hell of a mystery. Uh, we get selected data out of China, and yet Chinese demand is incredibly important for Canada because we have so many resources, so many commodities that are shipped into that market. And if their manufacturing sector is uh, humming along and Chinese GDP is growing at 9 or 10 percent, we're going to have you know great commodity prices in Canada. Right now, GDP in China is at seven and a half. I mean, that sounds extraordinary compared to Canada, which is around zero. But still, it's not really enough to sustain their population growth. Uh, and it is a slowdown by Chinese standards. Uh, so I think what you've referenced there is just another uh, indication that you know we may see some slagging demand coming out of uh, China. And it, Canada definitely is going to be whomped a bit by that. I saw the one good thing about climate change is apparently Canada is going to be the big winner because it's going to reveal new resources that right now are covered in ice and snow. (laughs) That could be. That could be, but boy, it sure keeps the environmentalists up at night uh, thinking about uh, drilling rigs in the Arctic. 
um, or uh, you know strip mines. All of that, we're going to have to be really careful about it. I, I certainly hope the Harper government is, is sensitive to those concerns. I don't know if they've been sensitive to anything. <laughs> I'm not the best guy to comment on that. He, he, he kicked my butt out, so um, I'm going to let that one lie, Jim. Uh, Garth, always a pleasure talking to you. Garth Turner, former National Revenue Minister, now a financial advisor at Raymond James. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Coming up, Marin Katusa on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. More and more people are looking to the Internet for intelligent, riveting, and thought-provoking interviews. To advertise on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com, call 604-699-8600, 604-699-8600. My guest is Marin Katusa, Senior Editor of the KC Energy Dividends and the KC Energy Report. A welcome to This Week in Money. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Marin, uh, one of the first things I wanted to talk about was uh, the civil unrest in Egypt. It's not going away. It bumped up the price of oil uh, a bit recently, and now the prices have come down a, uh, a little bit as well. But is this a long-term thing that we have to be concerned about? Oh, definitely. I, I, not just the um, Egypt. we got to look at what's going on in Syria. Uh, there's a lot of potential political and social risks that can cause a serious pinch to the spot price of oil overnight. I mean, I'm not just talking about Iran and Israel or, you know, what's going to happen with Syria. What about the, the, the biggest black swan of all, uh, a Shiite uprising where all the oil development is occurring in Saudi Arabia? That's the number two oil producer in the world, and chaos and civil unrest is bad for oil production. No fooling. I mean, uh, I mean, I never thought of uh, Egypt and Syria being big oil producers, and yet big concerns. Well, Egypt's a very large natural gas producer, and you know everyone thinks Egypt's just a bunch of pyramids and tourist locations. Well, unfortunately, because of all of the civil unrest, not only are they not selling the natural gas to places like Israel, and believe it or not, places like Iraq. Hence, why Iraq has just announced a major gas deal. Uh, where every two years they'll be potentially importing one PCF of gas from Iran. Uh, people aren't going there to for vacations either. So it's a double whammy for the Egyptian economy. And unless the government can subsidize their social agenda, uh, there's going to be civil unrest. And this is a problem with all of these third world developed, uh, developing nations with oil production because... Venezuela, people forget that over 50% of their budget goes to social programs, and all of that comes from their oil production. If Egypt can't uh, get its budget in line, and with this unrest, it's very unlikely, what does that mean for all the other major players in the oil patch? Well, in the Middle East, it, it, will it spread? Uh, Syria's been going on for two years. Um, you, you see now that Iran and Iraq are doing business together. Iran is backed by China and the Russians. So there's a lot of interesting pieces being moved around on the chessboard in the Middle East where, you know, once were the allies of the American and are now the enemies of the American. And the big wild card that I'm telling everyone to pay attention to is Saudi Arabia. No one has paid any attention to them. No, because it's been so good for so long. But that's what a black swan event is. It's the unexpected event. What could an investor do? Take a look at North America more seriously? I think you definitely want to look at, you know, the politics. You know, is it stable, secure production? You know, is the rule of law maintained? Is the risk of being nationalized or the tax code changed on you? You know, and people have to remember that Canada even did a form of nationalization of resources in the energy sector in 1980 with the National Energy Program. What they did was they just changed the tax code, which is a form of nationalization. They did it again on Halloween of 2006 when they changed the income trust rules. That's another form of nationalization. So even though places like Argentina, where YPF's assets were nationalized outright, well, that happens everywhere in the world, so you've got to be very, very careful. Look at the North Sea oil production. They had their tax system changed. So it's a way of the government's wanting a bigger take 
after companies take the risk of exploration, then developing, then producing, and then the governments change the rules as they go along. So this is a this is a huge risk in all resources, not just oil and gas, but copper, base metals, gold, precious metals, uranium. You have to look at where are you investing your dollars and what is the social and political risks going on. Sure, Barrick Gold found out the hard way with the Pasqua Lama line uh, mine on the Argentinian Chilean border. The court shut them down over environmental concerns, and now I'm hearing they they could face a write up of or a write off of up to ten billion dollars. Yeah, and that's the world's largest uh, you know <laughs> gold producer. So you're looking at if it could happen to them. Never mind some of these juniors. So be very very careful, and and that's a perfect example of what can happen. Uranium, uh, you've mentioned in your newsletter, is something that people might be taking a look at. I think it's uh, the, the cure for high prices is high prices, and u- uranium got ahead of itself in 2007. It had a big correction about a year before the general markets in late 08. Then it built its way up again, and then Fukushima really came out as a black swan. And then with Japan taking off their 54, 52 or 54 reactors, and then Germany announcing they're going to shut down 22 of their reactors. That was a big knock. Then at the same time, another issue no one talks about is the Koreans shut down eight of their reactors. So a lot of events lined up. But the reality is today, the producers of uranium who already have the you know permits, they've already built their mines, they can't make money at $36 uranium. And uranium is very different than, let's say, copper or gold. No, over 90% of the uranium is traded on a long-term contract. So if you want delivery in three years, let's say, you, you're not paying spot price, which is 36 You're paying just under $60. So what I'm telling people is to understand who's the market for uranium. It's these large utilities. So when someone, a big utility, let's say like Duke Energy in the U.S., it's the largest utility in, in, in North America, they care about just keeping the lights on. So they have to secure a long-term supply of uranium. Now, remember that over 90% of the uranium that's traded is in long-term contracts. So the market right now is looking at the spot price. So if you want to buy uranium today, it's $36. But what are you going to do with uranium? Are you going to put it in your safe at uh, in the <laughs> bank? Are you going to put it under your bed? No, whereas gold, you can. So the buyers for uranium are these utilities. So what's going on now, because of Japan, your, uh, the Germans, and the Koreans, there's been a little bit of an oversupply of U-308. But now it's trading where even if the spot price of uranium tripled, it makes less than a 5% difference to the electricity generating costs of the utility. So all they care about is making sure they have a secure supply. So let's just say if gold we knew was going to trade at over 50% premium in three years, what would be the stocks doing? They'd be going crazy because they're looking at future cash flow. So what's going to happen in the uranium market is at the end of the HEU agreement, which expires at the end of this year, the Russians are going to now renegotiate all these prices. And this time the Americans have to compete with the Chinese. Even the Saudis are building 16 nuclear reactors. The, The Japanese can't afford paying five times more for their natural gas than they are in America for electricity generation. So you know that they're coming back. They've already stated they're going to be building nukes, uh, putting their nukes back on. And then look at India, look at Korea coming back on, and even Germany. They have no choice but to bring back their nukes because they're buying nuclear energy from the French at twice the price of what they could generate it for. So all of this stuff has been political lip service, and you're going to see the spot price of uranium is going to be a stepwise function where it's not going to go up 25 cents every day. It's going to move up five, ten dollars every month. And it's going to be a big move because these utilities need the long-term supply of uranium. It's and uh, just recently there was a, a find of a major supply of uranium in Saskatchewan. Well, that's still exploration. So we've recommended that company. It's called Fission. We had over 100% gain with it. We decided to take our uh, profits. We ha- we keep the management in high regard. We've actually made a double on it twice. But you see, if you make a new find, first of all, that's exploration. 
I've been up to the basin many times in the Athabasca Basin, and even if they prove up, let's say, 100 million pounds there, which there's a good shot that, you know, they're going to be somewhere north of 50 million pounds of very high-grade near-surface uranium, it's going to take at least, in the best-case scenario, over 10 years to permit that and build the mine. So they got a lot of work to do before they get into production, so who's going to buy them out? And There's a lot of risks moving forward, and, you know, it's a fairly valued project as it is. So what I'm telling people is be careful what you're buying and uh, don't be shy to take profits. Wow. So, And this is a market. They don't post the uranium price on the evening news. <laughs> no. It, 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 it's, it's, look, you want to buy things when people are hurting and when no one's talking about it. And once it's popular, that's when you want to sell it. And once they're talking about it every day in the news and your local media and the free newspapers and, you know, when the housewives are talking about investing in uh, uranium stocks, that's when you want to sell the stuff, okay? Right now, it's the opposite. It's hated. You know, it's the Homer Simpson effect where, you know, anyone dealing in, in nuclear energy is going to screw up the world. You wouldn't believe how many emails I get from people saying that I'm ruining the world by developing these assets. That's when I know... I'm going to make money in the stock because people forget that one in every five homes in America is powered by nuclear energy. So everyone who thinks they're driving these green cars and, you know, the Hollywood guys thinking they're feeling good, where do you think you're getting that electricity from? A hole in the wall? Well, that's what they think. That's what they plug in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, natural gas. We've had a natural gas well blowout in the Gulf of Mexico. Is that going to have any effect on natural gas prices over the summer? No, none at all. You see, the difference between, let's say, the uh, Gulf of Mexico oil spill of 2010 and this blowout is natural gas disperses easily in the, in the environment, whereas oil is a much heavier compound, so it sticks around for a lot longer. So when you flare out the gas, it pretty much just disappears. So it's going to have no long-term effect to the environment. So, no, it's not going to change anything. Uh, more and more we're hearing concerns about fracking. Is that going to have an impact on natural gas prices in the near future? Yeah, it already has. It's been a complete game changer, and it's going to continue keeping natural gas prices low in North America. And in 15 years, you'll see a lot of the European countries moving towards it. And in 25 years, the Europeans will finally be where the Americans are on this. So that's a big opportunity is to figure out which companies in Europe are going to be able to repeat the great gains and execution of the North American companies. So there's a lot of talk about how, you know, places in uh, the U.S. are going to uh, ban fracking and it's bad and all this stuff. The science will, will eventually speak. And the end of the day is people don't want to pay $5 a gallon or $6 a gallon for gas to fill their cars up. So the reality is shale fracking, tight oil, tight gas, the unconventional technologies are here to stay. Is uh, BC Premier Christy Clark right to put her uh, trust in the growth of liquefied natural gas? Well, I think, you know, you know, it's an interesting thing. In January, I was asked to debate the founder of Greenpeace. And, you know, I took some time off last year and I came back to the, 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 the sector and I said, sure. So it was my big splash back into the business. And um, when I debated him, I said, you know, we need a sensible solution, a diversified energy matrix. And when we spoke about, you know, they were talking about the Canadian oil sands is going to ruin the world and, and uh, they can't build this Keystone XL pipeline, so they're very against it. And I just stated a simple fact to them, and this is a televised debate where I said, by preventing the modern pipelines to be developed, what you're actually doing is putting Canadians and the Canadian environment at greater risk because over 15% of the pipelines that are in use today in North America were built at the same time as Elvis Presley was on the top of the charts, okay, in the late 50s and early 60s, before the Beatles even came around. So let's think about this. Should we be, te be depending on aging infrastructure? And the second thing I said, because we're not developing this new, improved, modern technology for pipelines, we're depending on rail. And I said rail is over 30 times more likely to have a major disaster than a pipeline. That's the government statistics. It's not my statistics. It's not KC Research statistics. Those are the government environmental statistics. And unfortunately, 
after that debate, we had the disaster in Quebec, where over 50 people have died because of the rail cars carrying oil exploded. So what I'm trying to explain to the environmentalists, including Greenpeace, is we need to move forward in a sensible solution. That means LNG, that means pipelines, that means putting up environmental bonds and regulating what we're doing. You can't depend on the aging infrastructure and prevent any new development because all you're doing is putting not just the Canadians, but the Canadian environment at risk. Marin, is there a website people can go to to find out more information about your uh, energy analysis? Sure. If, uh, if people want to try a free trial, it's a guaranteed money uh, back risk-free trial. If you don't like what I'm doing, uh, you just go to caseyresearch.com, C-A-S-E-Y research.com, and uh, you can see what we're doing. Thanks a lot for talking with us. Oh, it's a pleasure. All righty. Thank you very much. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. My guest is Jack Crooks, president of Black Swan Capital. We'll be talking about currency, equity, and futures markets. Japan, they have some interesting ideas on how to keep their economy afloat, but are they good ideas, Jack? Well, I think uh, so far we've seen some success uh, with Prime Minister's aims policies. Um, implicitly, they've attempted to weaken the end, and uh, they've succeeded. And we are actually are seeing some, you know, uptick in the domestic economy, uh, thanks to some of the some of the changes in the yen, increases in exports uh, for the first time in a while. And I think you're generally seeing a little more confidence come back uh, into the the Japanese consumers because. Uh, to tell you the truth, they needed something drastic uh, to happen, and Abe is uh, convinced that uh, he's going to do it. Um, so we're now to the point at which we're at the third phase, or what he's referred to as the third arrow of his strategy, and that includes uh, a lot of regulation reform, you know, something kind of from a bottom-up standpoint um, in order to drive more and more consumer demand inside the country, increase confidence, inside Japan and ultimately lead to, you know, a, a stronger economy because the end game for Japan is trying to get enough money in the door so they can cover their massive um, revenue problems and their problems are developed because they, you know, created so much debt in their system. Um, so that's why Abe has, uh, you know, launched onto this, what's referred to as a, an experiment for the Japanese economy. Um, the jury's still out, but I do think uh, at the moment, if you look at uh, what's happened to the stock market, what's happening to the currency, you're seeing uh, a lot of a lot of confidence on a relative basis return to Japan. And of course, too, uh, they've probably reached the point where they've recovered from the tsunami. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's part of the process. Of, you know, the, the tsunami problem uh, was you know was buried in those numbers to make it look a little worse uh, than expected. Um, and we are seeing some recovery there. And, and the funny thing is it's probably helped to a degree unleash some of the domestic investment, um, the rebuilding um, domestically f- for those companies that, that were impacted by the tsunami. So it may have been in and of itself a little kickstart in terms of internal uh, boost um, as bad as the disaster was. Now, I don't want to get into that idea that you have to have disasters to help an economy, but I do think it's just – uh, the timeliness uh, was was interesting because one of the problems for Japan has been that um, they didn't they were hollowing out because the currency was so strong that companies were afraid to invest domestically um, with a weakening currency and uh, more investment weakening currency it allows uh, companies to loosen up on their capital budgets and invest more inside the economy and that's part of the process that. Uh, Prime Minister Abe wants to try and continue kind of that self-feeding uh, positive upside in that more investment by their local companies, uh, more tax revenues, more employment, um, and he especially wants uh, the domestic side to get into gear. You said they're looking at uh, regulation reform. I can imagine a country like Japan where people file by row to leave a sports stadium has a lot of regulations and rules about how to proceed. They really do. They really do. Uh, and one of the big uses on the agricultural side of the fence, um, you know, he may open up a lot of that domestic farming that's locked up um, and open it up to some uh, outside investment and at least uh, some corporate farming to a large degree. Um, they also have a lot of 
regulation really on goods still coming into Japan, you know, despite the fact that they haven't been charged as, you know, kind of, a, in, in, I guess, trade infractions the way we look at China um, because they're our ally. Um, Japan has had many barriers on trade uh, for a while, and that goes to the regulatory side um, of the fence. So he's looking really just to make the, the economy much more dynamic and open it up more to the outside world. Um, but you're right, it's not, a, it's not an easy process when you have people that are used to, to taking orders to, to turn it into more an innovative, risk-taking country, which is what a... Uh, you know, again, as part of the Abe strategy, and uh, as you as you as you pointed out, that's not an easy task. Uh, the people there like regulations; they're used to them, and everything being very orderly. Uh, could they react to a more of a helter skelter kind of market? You know, that's what uh, the jury's still out on that. You know, can they become more innovative, more risk taking? Um, and it's difficult, especially given their their demographics. You know, Japan's getting older and older, and as we get older. We get, you know, more and more conservative. So, so it's a, it's a tough, uh, tough problem, um, for Abe to try and achieve these goals. Um, but, um, we've seen stranger, stranger things happen before. So I just think time will tell, um, as it always does. Uh, I think we'll know within the next, uh, six to eight months whether this is working or not. With uh, Japan's birth rate at a horribly low rate, any chance the government is going to give people more incentive to have children? Yeah, I think you'll see all of that. Uh, that's exactly right. I think you're, you're going to, in order to really drive uh, enthusiasm and real dynamism into the domestic economy as opposed to just running off that export model, um, those are the types of things they need to make happen. Um, and one of the ways uh, may may be to loosen up on some of the immigra- immigration into Japan, which we know is very very tight. Uh, I'm not saying that's on the front burner, but but these are things um, that are out there that, that could happen pretty quickly. I was just going to ask about immigration. We know Japan's a small country; it's pretty crowded. But that's in the urban areas. They have a lot of countryside where it's still super rural and just farming. That's right, and the farming is very very controlled. Um, those farmers are highly protected by the regulation. Um, that those those land areas are again highly regulated, um, and that's part of uh, the process of freeing up some of those those assets in Japan to make them more productive. Please stay on the line, Jack. We'll be back to this week in money right after this. The best of the best, Randy Elvis Frisky and his Las Vegas show band with Cassandra Frisky. August 16th, Surrey, 17th, Chilliwack, September 14th, Kamloops. Details at randyelvisfrisky.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. My guest is Jack Crooks of Black Swan Capital. On this side of the Pacific, anything uh, in our uh, current equity market that has you scared or concerned? Um, just the general problem that I've been looking at for a while, it's the disconnect between, uh, I think, the run-up in these equities um, relative to still what's happening in the real economy. Granted, we've seen some improvement in the U.S. economy, um, but the consumer is still kind of in his hole a bit. Real incomes aren't exactly um, running away, um, and we have corporate earnings um, that are still, especially on a global basis, when you look at where their earnings come from the multinationals, a uh, big part of it comes from the international side of the fence. To me, that's very, very suspect. But the reality is, the money being uh, created, or at least the, the money being held on the bank's balance sheets at the moment in the U.S., is still going into the financial assets and uh, providing a heck of a prop to the stock market. Not sure when that ends, but, but what does bother me is the disconnect still between the real economy uh, where we work and live um, and financial assets, stocks, and, and, uh, and I think there's a big gap there, uh, whether or not we just see a, a big rebound of the U.S. economy to fill that gap. Uh, or we see stocks come off. I tend to think, um, you know, sooner or later, people are going to run out of faith in central banks here, uh, especially the U.S. central bank, if we don't get some type of stronger rebound in the real economy. You know, that's kind of the last, uh, you know, last shoe to fall. You know, at the moment, fund managers, hedge managers, uh, the paparazzi, the, the intelligentsia are making a lot of money on their stocks. Uh, but people, as I said, that work in the real world that aren't connected with stocks and don't have 401ks going straight up, um, don't have good job prospects. 
So that wedge is, uh, is, is significant. And sooner or later, I think that cap has to be closed one way or another. On the currency front, uh, you said you were in Europe and, uh, you know, both the Canadian and U.S. dollars, uh, doing very well against the euro. Is it going to start to become more expensive? Is, I think, uh, at the moment, the U.S. dollar looks very, very well poised long term to appreciate against the, the euro. And the reason I say that is despite the, the uptick we've seen in the eurozone economy, uh, just this week, some of the numbers have improved. Um, I do think it's a, just a relative analysis currency and always will be in that on an intermediate to long-term basis, one has to suspect that the U.S. economy is going to outperform Europe. Uh, and if so, the U.S. will have a, a growth advantage, and I do think a yield advantage going forward. Um, those are two powerful drivers for a currency. So, uh, so as I said, even though the euro has, uh, you know, last 10 days has made a nice little corrective move, and I'm referring to this rally as corrective, I think sooner or later the long-term trend will will, will come into play again. Uh, and I do think we can see the euro down, you know, into 120 range against the U.S. dollar, uh, because despite uh, some of the improvement of the numbers, you know, countries like Italy are dying on the vine. Uh, Greece is still a problem whether or not they're going to pull out. Cyprus is, is hanging out there. Uh, Ireland, people in Ireland are not happy. Uh, Spain finally had a little bit of improvement in their unemployment levels, but they're sky high. So at any moment, one of these, you know, politicians could wake up one day and say, we really are considering leaving the euro. It's our best bet. So the potential for crisis, uh, in the eurozone is still there. And the reality is, these countries cannot grow without money, and lending in Europe is still falling off the cliff. Uh, banks are, are deleveraging and pulling back uh, all across Europe, and that's not a good sign. And that's why I say, you know, even though this tacit improvement in European growth numbers are, are okay, there's a lot of rot still underneath the surface, and one has to think, despite the warts in the U.S. economy, it, it can outgrow uh, Europe pretty substantially, and that's why we're still dollar bullish. Uh, when it comes to Canada, um, I think it really is uh, another situation in which the Canadian dollar looks so much better than the euro in terms of the, the economy. Uh, I don't think the two are comparable. Um, so I do I do like the euro-Canadian dollar cross, uh, you know, playing the uh, Canadian dollar uh, on the long side. So so that looks very advantageous to me, too, longer term. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the way I see it. It's just a relative growth game. Uh, and with the systemic risk flowing out of Europe, I don't think it's going to be good for the euro longer term still. Do you think uh, there's a danger the U.S. will turn to protectionism again, uh, upping duties and so on, uh, to keep exports out and to uh, force people to produce more at home? I absolutely do. And I think uh, that the potential for tariffs is really rising as China gets more and more concerned about their growth. Um, the other factor in here, we wrote about, I wrote about this the other day, is that Germany, i.e. Northern Europe, um, really wants to continue to push out those exports into the global economy. And the reality is the, the aggregate demand in the global economy is falling, especially now when China started to weaken. And as I said, the U.S. consumer hasn't rebounded. So the setup here um, is for um, some real potential for some uh, problems uh, on the global level of these countries not cooperating. And if their growth doesn't turn around, they're going to do exactly what you said. They're going to use, uh, they're going to, we're going to see more and more trade barriers go up if the U.S. economy doesn't rebound as most expect. So I, I do see that as a, a real potential systemic problem for the, for the global economy going forward. Um, and as I said, because, uh, be, because, you know, China is starting to fall, um, and they were kind of the ones that we were hoping to keep global demand alive. Um, it, the, the game is getting a little more risky, um, ironically, at a time when some people are turning more and more bullish on the U.S. economy. Jack, thanks a lot for talking with us. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks to our guests, Garth Turner, Marin Katuza, and Jack Crooks. And thank you for listening. I'm Jim Goddard for Phil Mackesee. We're back next week with more This Week in Money. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated.